Clean Living at Home is brought to you by Nedbank. Make things happen. Last week, we took a look at the design and green elements of Brad Clark's astonishing eco-friendly home. Today, we're going to explore all the different green elements he's used in his garden to make it as environmentally responsible as possible. Firstly, Brad's converted a large part of his garden into an organic vegetable patch, where he grows more healthy veggies than he and his family can use. We don't do too well on the rooted veggies, because I think the rooted veggies require quite a poor uh, poorly fed soil and I think we our compost is, is too rich for that but you really do well with the squashes and cucumbers and and baby marrows and beans and peas and things like that so we rotate the crops through um, we try to not grow a, a mono crop so the same crop all next to each other so we do you know a bed like this of um, baby marrows at the moment and then once they're out we might put uh, cucumbers in or butternut or something like that and rotate it. Even though Brad's veggie garden is substantial, he uses no municipal water for irrigation. In an average growing season, his garden produces around 80 kilograms of beans and around 110 kilograms of butternut per 12 by 6 meter tunnel, largely due to the high quality homemade compost he uses. There's, there's two big drivers when you want to farm veggies in an organic, mat, organic way. The first one is you need to produce your own compost and not use kind of industrially manufactured fertilizers. And this, the second thing is insecticides and, and how you produce them and then obviously where, where you get your seed from. There's lots of theories about compost and how you make compost and if you should turn it or if you shouldn't turn it and how long you should leave it and all of those kinds of things. So we do um, our method of compost is actually putting them in these pens here so they're quite well aerated. Um, we layer it only by virtue is when we're collecting cow dung, we collect all the cow dung and put it in. The veggie scraps go on as and when they come out of the kitchen so we're not really scientific about that. And then what we do differently is we're in no hurry for compost. So we leave our compost for a year to mature and break down. And we've got four pens like this that we do that in and we just rotate through all the compost pens. We recycle all kitchen waste, um, cardboard even. If you have raw cardboard, it's great for composts. Uh, veggie scraps, eggshells. The cow manure is great. That's the main component that we, we put here. Brad's solution to the second issue he raised regarding growing organic vegetables, namely the use of insecticides, is as simple and as organic as you can get. Our method of controlling insects and bugs and things like that, we employ the chickens and the chickens are free roaming so they roam everywhere on the farm and they can eat the bugs. They spend quite a lot of time on the compost heaps, sharing it with the hardy dyes, eating insects and things like that and then walking between the, 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 the veggie patches and, and eating them. Brad used a similar method to control the rat and mosquito problem he had when he first bought the property. One that brings balance and harmony to his garden. We um, approached some guys called Eco Solutions who uh, delivered us some owls that we took care of for three weeks and then released them. So to date we've released uh, nine owls altogether, including barn owls and spotted eagle owls. And they came in and it took the owls, I'd say roughly about 18 months and they created that equilibrium where we don't have a problem with, with rats at all anymore. The reason why we live out here is to get away from chemicals and poisons and things like that. So the last thing I want to be doing is spraying my kids from head to toe with insecticides to stop the mozzies eating them. So we employed a, a similar method and it, it's a lot easier and a lot simpler. We just got hold of some bat boxes and put up the bat boxes and it doesn't take long for, for bats to move in. So we've got two species of bat that kind of have taken up residence in our bat boxes. We've got the yellow house bat and the Saratoga bats. And a bat is a, is a wonderful creature when it comes to eating mozzies. The, literature that I've read said about a thousand mozzies a night per bat and we're estimating we've got about 80 bats on the property so 80,000 mozzies a night that get eaten by the bat instead of them eating me is a good plan I think. Another issue Brad faced when he first moved onto the land was that the indigenous trees had largely been taken over by alien invader species. He's in the process of slowly reversing this issue. Uh, a long-term project is to replace a lot of the trees and we, we work on a policy, a two for one policy, where for every one invader tree we cut down, we, we force ourselves to plant two indigenous trees. Um, 
so these trees will eventually go. And we've got our in indigenous trees, the Saltus africana here right behind it in a cage because the cows like eating it. So we try and protect them from the cows a little bit. So once those trees um, grow up a little bit, then we'll cut down these and then use the wood in our log burners in the house over winter as a, a method for heating. The idea of having everything on the property having multiple functions is a core concept in making the farm work. So, the trees provide shelter for birds and insects, as well as fuel for his fireplaces. The chickens provide eggs, work as insect removers, and replenish the nitrogen in the vegetable patch soil. Even Brad's organic lawn mowers have more than one use. Yeah, so the cows perform a couple of functions. Firstly, they are pets, so we like having them around. And they give us quite a nice farm feel. Um, they produce compost for us, um, and they keep the grass short, so we never have to mow the lawn. And then we can also introduce the manure into our biodigester, which produces natural gas that we can use for cooking inside the house. So the cows actually have a multitude of, of purposes. Um, and we can also sell their offspring to, to you know, help us fund living this lifestyle that we do. Reusing and recycling is a key element of eco-living. Brad even went as far as using the rubble from the derelict buildings he found on the property to create a key feature of his garden. We have, we have quite a rustic uh, landscaping design here where we've got these five raised portions and we're linking them with bridges. So later on these gum poles will have some kind of surface on them so we can walk between them. And the main idea is that it's a grazable garden so the cows can come in here, it's another camp for them uh, to eat. And then us as humans can play at, at this kind of level and all the snakes and hedgehogs and frogs and mongoose and that kind of live at a, at a, on the lower level from us and we uh, try not to cross each other's paths too much, especially the snakes and the small kids. We try to keep them separate and that's really the main driver between the mounds and it also creates a little bit of interest. So you can also see they descend in size so they go from a really big one that we can kick a ball on and play with the kids all the way down getting closer to the house as a small one. So it gives you a little bit of a false perspective, it's a little bit of a design thing where because they decrease in size it gives you a, a perception of more space if you're looking from the big one down to the small one and if mom's down there looking up at the kids playing on the top mound, mom's a little bit more comfortable because it, you get a little bit of foreshortening with that so she feels the kids are a little bit closer to her. So. It's a little bit of a design trick. Brad's dislike for chemicals and his desire to have everything serve multiple purposes even extends to his swimming pool. We've got an eco pool that we've set up in our garden. We're lucky enough to have enough space to do it. Um, eco pool employs a, a, an age-old system, which is a, a wetland. So we hear a lot in the news about the importance of wetlands and a lot of people don't under, fully understand why wetlands are so important. So we use no chemicals in our pool. All the water in the pool gets cycled through a wetland. And the, the theory is a simple one, that the wetland plants and the microbes in the wetland take out all the nutrients of the water so that by the time the water gets to your pool, it's sterile. So no algae or, or anything that we as humans don't like swimming in can live in your pool. And it's a simple, simple process. It's, it's just once again using the balance of nature, how nature looks after itself, we've just employed that little ecosystem here. And it becomes an ecosystem on its own. It has plants, it has dragonflies, it has frogs. And that's one of the beauties of it, that in your swimming pool now, like we have, we've got frogs. In our swimming pool, we've got water lilies that we swim with, and we've got a couple of koi fish. So again, that old principle that we've spoken about before is, the pool is many things. It's a drinking trough for the cows when they're grazing in this area. It's a fish pond, it's a swimming pond, um, and it's a little bit of a feature in the garden. Next week, we'll head inside and see what green elements Brad has used for the interior of his home. Green Living at Home is brought to you by Nedbank. Make things happen.